EWTN goes on location to Ohio for Cleveland Right to Life's Bringing America Back to Life 2015 conference. Today, Dr. Patrick Lee discusses how to make the logical case for life. Everyone knows, I mean, this is basic science, that when the sperm penetrates the ovum, once that happens, the sperm ceases to be, it drops its tail off, it loses its head, gets inside, it's seeking a female ovum. When it unites to the female ovum, it loses its head. Typical male thing, I guess. <laughs> but it ceases to be a sperm. The ovum receives the sperm. And then immediately after that, or immediately at that point, it changes its properties, or the thing that's there changes its properties. And what's there now repels penetration by any other sperm, which means that it's not an ovum anymore. It's not a sex cell. A sex cell, a female sex cell, is something that is oriented to, intrinsically oriented to, uh, joining with a sperm, receiving sperm. So now, after fertilization, or at fertilization, it now repels any penetration of a sperm, which means it's not the same. It's now it's changed. There's a change in fundamental nature. So it's no longer an ovum. Now we have a new cell that is neither a sperm nor an ovum. And this new cell then, after several hours, divides into two, then it divides into four, then into eight, then 16, and so on. Some of the divisions are asynchronous, so that you don't, you don't always get even numbers at, at every stage. But it's developing itself by an internal, internally directed process. And we know that. So what science shows us, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go into all of it, because we don't, we don't want to, you, don't, you just want to get some of the things that, that you just want to make some of the points that people can remember. When a sperm unites with an ovum, the sperm ceases to be, the ovum ceases to be, you get a new thing that's neither sperm nor ovum. That new thing then divides the 2, 4, 8, 16, so on. It's now a multicellular organism because those cells do not act independently of each other. They act as parts of a single whole. It's actively developing itself in an ordered, completely predictable manner. It needs a certain environment, but given that environment, it internally directs how it will develop. At day three, it differentiates into two different types of cells. Inner cell mass cells, which will become the permanent part of the embryo, and then the tr the, on the outer cell mass, the, what are called the trophoblast, which will, which will, which is the rudiments of the placenta, and also the the the, uh, the parts of the embryo that burrow into the uterus of the of the mother. So day three, it's different. It has different types of cells. Even earlier than that, it is that it is the different cells are differentiating within their genes. And what that means is that you don't have just a, a blind proliferation of cells. You don't just have a mass of cells. The cells are not like each other. They're, they already are differentiated. There's already gene differentiation even at the two cell stage. So there's an ordered, there's an order, there's an internally directed order of growth that's completely predictable. What that means is that you have a distinct organism and it has, it grows in accord with the genetic program that is inside, that is within it, within its cells. It's guided by that genetic program that is there from the beginning. So here we have something that has all of the information it needs 
to actively develop itself to the mature stage of a human organism. All of this is just something that embryologists, all, it's in all the embryology texts. It has, it's so, so it has all of the information needed that's going to guide its, its ordered and sequential development on to the mature stage of a human organism. It need, all it needs is a suitable environment and nutrition. So it has all of the internal resources needed to actively develop itself to the mature stage of human organism, which indicates it already is a human organism, a distinct human organism. So that's something that's known. Then, of course, it grows. It, 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 uh, it, it, it differentiates itself into cells that are specialized to burrow into the placenta, to the, uh, to the uterus of the mother, begins to implant on the wall on day six. It differentiates itself into different layers that are the rudiments of the different body systems. By day 14, you have a beating heart. By the sixth week, you have a functioning, the, the rudiments of the functioning brain. There you have the brain function is not complete. Actually, the brain won't be complete until after birth. There's a great deal of, of uh, development of the brain after birth. But the brain is already there. The rudiments of the brain are there on, from day 14 on. So it's, and all of this is happening. The, the, the uterus the, only provides environment. It doesn't there's no, there's no change in the development of this entity from fertilization onward that changes it, it, it gives it a new direction of growth. So all of that indicates that it is a human, a distinct human organism, and also a whole human organism, not part of a larger human organism. So it's a distinct, whole, albeit immature, human organism. Now, that doesn't, of course, prove everything. It doesn't get to the end of the whole discussion. But the point is, what it, what's actively growing, what's actively developing him, sir, himself or herself, because sex is determined from the beginning, so it's not an it, okay. what uh, what this being is, is a human, is a distinct human organism. Now, the second point to make, I think, okay, to say, okay, here's some evidence that indicates this is a, is a whole human organism, albeit an immature stage of development. The second point, I think, to show or indicate is that, uh, well, what we are are human organisms. We're not just a set of conscious experiences behind or hidden behind this body. We're not just souls in bodies. We're not, we don't just possess bodies. We are body, we would say we're body-soul composites. The body is an essential part of us. We are, we are particular types of bodies. We are human organisms. You and I are human organisms. Particular types of human organisms, rational or human organisms with intellect and free choice. But nevertheless, we are particular types of, of human organisms. So if that's the kind, and that's the, that's the kind of being that we are, okay, we know that if you, um, if I, if I, uh, if I, if I'm walking and I, uh, I'm walking into a room and I knock something over that was on the coffee table, I say, excuse me. I don't say, oh, my body did that. I'm, excuse me, I knocked that over, okay? I knocked it over because my body is part of me. I am, I am a bodily entity. So the human organism isn't something that we possess. It's not something that we are sort of 
buried within or something that we, we, that we are hidden in. We are human organisms. Now that's an important point because that means that, that the thing that is in the womb and you and, me, you and I are the same kinds of beings. Okay? There is some kind of sameness there. Okay? Yeah, they look very different from us. They're very much smaller than us. But there is one thing that's, that's got, that is the same. They're human organisms. We're human organisms. The only way to deny that, and so of course some people will, will deny that, the only way to deny that is either to deny something that science shows, that embryology shows, or to deny that, that we are bodily entities, to take a sort of Platonist position or something like that. Okay, so I've made this, well, frankly I've made this part of it a little longer than I wanted to, but it, basically you make the point a little quicker is that first, science shows these are, these are human organisms in there. What's killed in abortion? Well, there's, some people will, will, will debate on whether it's a person or not, but it's certainly a human organism. And you and I are human organisms. So there's some kind of sameness there. Yeah, they're a lot different from us. But then now, Lynn, that's, those are the two points I think to lead off with. To say, yeah, those are human organisms, and also we are human organisms. So then the question is, now I think we should ask some questions. Why is it okay to kill them? They must be very different from us. Okay. It's, not okay to, it's not okay for you to kill me. It's not okay for me to kill you. Well, you know, maybe it, it must be because they're very different from us. Well, well, what is it? What is the? In other words, if if they are human organisms, then th then the person who says it's okay to kill this being needs to, the burden of proof is on this person to say, well, okay, show us what is different about this thing that makes it okay to kill them. It's not okay to kill. They're all sort. There's there's. There are several human organisms in this, uh, in this room right now that it would not be okay to kill. Right? But somehow, according to the pro-abortionist, and I'm not saying that they're all, I mean, they don't always think these things out, okay? But somehow, according to the pro-abortionist, it's okay to kill. There are some hu human organisms that it's okay to kill. Now, what is it dif what's different about those human organisms that makes it okay to kill them? It's not okay to kill you and me, but it is. But according to them, it is okay to kill these human organisms. Well, what's the difference? What difference grounds that differential treatment? What difference grounds the fact that it's according to them, it's okay to, 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 for, for us to kill them? It's okay for us to rip them to shreds or to or to uh, 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 throw them in the trash can. Well, what are the differences between? Yeah, there are a lot of differences between human embryos, unborn humans, and born humans. And we can't, we don't deny that there are differences, right? We don't deny that there are a lot of differences between unborn humans and born humans. And some of those differences in many ways are significant. So then I think the next stage of the discussion, the next stage of the conversation would be this, to ask the, to ask the other person you're talking to, okay, well, these are human organisms, we're human organisms, so then if you think it's okay to kill them, there must be something, some difference that makes it okay to kill them and it's not okay to kill us. What is that? T tell me what that difference is. And now they may not, you know, maybe they'll come forth with an answer, and then we can, we can examine that. But then we need to ask, well, ask ourselves, okay, where, what are the differences? How are unborn human beings different from born human beings? And there are a lot of differences. Well, I mean, some obvious ones. They're a lot smaller than we are, right? They get their oxygen differently than we do. They're swimming around. They don't have any clothes on, right? Uh, they're, uh, they are, uh, 
They don't have their lung, their young, their lungs aren't yet functioning. Right? They don't yet actually reason, make free choices. Not yet, anyway. Right? So there are there are differences. They differ in size. I mean, and at this point, I think we should ask, you know, let's start thinking about this being. Because it, it, the, the problem with a lot of discussions about abortion, I, I think, is that people don't even think about that being. So they should be made at least to visualize that being. Let's look at this being. Let's look at this thing that is killed in abortion. And lack, so we can begin, and they'll, they'll, they'll be willing to, to talk about how different this being is. Okay. Yeah, the, he's different in size. Okay, at the very beginning, he's only, he's no, no, the, he or she is no, no larger than the period at the end of a sentence. Okay. Different in shape in some ways. There's a, there's a huge difference of degree of development. Right. They're at the very beginning stages of their development. You and I have been here for some of us a lot longer than others. Right? So go through the differences and look at those differences. Honestly, look at the differences. But then the question is this: Okay, yeah, there's there are differences. There are there are differences between the unborn human and the born human, between human embryos and fetuses, are very different from you and me. But the question is. Are any of those differences morally significant? Yeah, groups of people, when there are groups of people being killed, obviously there's got to be some difference there. But the question is, is the difference morally significant? These are human beings, and now, yes, they differ in size. They differ in degree of development. They don't yet make free choices and reason, although they're the kind of being that eventually will. All of the ways in which they differ from us, that in some ways are startling, yeah, they get their oxygen differently from us. All of those differences, though, are inessential differences. They're not differences that make you one kind of being rather than another kind of being. That's what an inessential difference is, of course, right? There's a, there's a, there is an, an, I have a Texan accent, so my, I have trouble with the articles, like uh, an, my an sounds like a n, I guess, just like, well, anyway, <laughs> an, a, the letter an, and then essential, there is a essential difference between a dog and a human being. Okay? And there are a lot of significant differences between us and unborn humans, but the question is, but, but the point is, those are inessential differences. They don't make us one kind of being as opposed to a different kind of being. Okay? Now, it's, now, this doesn't by itself prove it, but so far forth, it looks like, or at least throw this out as a possibility, uh, it looks like they are fastening that they are fastening on inessential differences and ignoring the essential sameness. That's what happens in racism, sexism, and other types of bigotry. Now, it doesn't mean that the person that we are speaking with is always necessarily hateful and bigoted. They may just be confused. They may just not understand what's going on. But what's being done is ignoring of an essential sameness and fastening upon inessential differences. Differences in what we would call accidental attributes. Accidental in the sense of uh, they're not part of the substance of the thing, not part of the thing itself. So fastening upon or focusing upon accidental or inessential differences and ignoring the essential sameness, that's what we had in the 19th century in the issue of slavery. 
Because what's the point about the slavery issue? Was that, yes, they differ in the color of their skin, but the color of the skin is not an essential difference. It's not a difference in the kind of being one is. It's an inessential difference. And it's unfair, it's unjust, to focus on inessential differences and ignore the essential sameness. But that's what's going on with the unborn human being, because there is, as biology shows, there is an essential sameness. It's the same kind of being as you and I. There are all sorts of inessential differences that seem to some people very significant. But where do you draw a line between what's a significant difference and what's an insignificant difference in terms of morally speaking? What's morally relevant? Is size morally relevant? If size is morally relevant, I've become more valuable in the 40 years since I got married. I got a lot of value put on me, uh, gained in size. Uh, Is degree of maturity, is the degree of development, is that a morally significant difference? Why, why should it be? A human being comes into existence. Whenever the human being comes into existence, you've got a new thing with a vast potential in the sense of it has the potential to actively develop itself and do all sorts of things. That's the thing that we are going to either help along that way to help develop himself or herself, or we're going to attack that being, ignore that being, or, or, what, or, or what? That being, that's what's valuable, not his or her attributes. So I think the first kind of approach I would, I would suggest is to say, well, look, here, here we have to make a, we have to ask, OK, look, what is being killed? Science shows what's being killed is a human organism. Well, that's strange. You and I are human organisms. That means you and I can't, you and I once were human embryos. And you and I once were fetuses. If what I am is a human organism, then I came to be when that human organism came to be. Now, there are all sorts of inessential things that I've become later on. I'm, I'm a professor or I'm a teacher. Okay? I, became, I came to be at one point, and then several years later, I became a teacher. Or you might be a basketball player. You come to be at one point, and then later on, you become a basketball player. But the, we're talking about the kind of thing you are, the thing that you are, does not come to be at a different time than you come to be. You don't, you, when the thing that you are comes to be, that's when you come to be. So that means if what you are is a, is a human organism, then you came to be, you and I came to be when that human organism that we are came to be. When does science say that the human organism comes to be? Well, when the sperm meets the ovum, and you get a new organism, and a new organism with the internal resources, all of the internal resources needed to actively, actively develop himself or herself to the mature stage of a human organism. So it is a human organism, only at an immature stage. OK, so it's a human organism. You and I are human organisms. So you and I once were embryos or fetuses. So the question's going to be also, now we could move on to this next point, I think, is to say, well, look, the question here is, what makes you and I valuable? Are you and I valuable in virtue of you and me, in virtue of the kinds of, thing we are, kinds of things that we are? Or are you and I valuable because of certain attributes we acquire at some later stage of our development. That's what's at stake. Are human beings valuable because of the, of the very things that they are, or are they valuable because they acquire certain 
accidental character, certain inessential characteristics later on. That's what's the, at, the, at the stake of this debate. That's the same kind of debate we had in the 19th century. Are things valuable because they, we think of their education, we think of their, the color of their skin, we think of you know, the way they look? Are human beings valuable because of the very kinds of beings that they are? So that's what I think. I think my suggestion is to make a couple of points. Okay, science shows that these are human organisms. We're human organisms, and then they say, okay, well then show me the difference. That's a morally significant difference. Yeah, there are differences, but are those differences morally significant? Okay, the second kind of argument, the second kind of case, I would second kind of. The second logical case, not unrelated to the first one, is a more, the more direct argument. And here I want to, I think I can help you by just trying to, to lay out, this isn't original on my part, but I think I can help you by laying out the basic structure of the, of the direct case and to make a couple of points about these significant steps. There are two steps, two fundamental steps, then there are sub-steps within those two steps. Okay. The two steps are, they're, they're t first, uh, and I've already touched on this, is, is the question of, is, the, is what is killed in abortion a human being, a human organism? And then the second step is, okay, granted that it's a human organism, is it also a human person? Because some people, some philosophers, and some th people say, well, it's a human organism, but it's not yet a person, or it's not a subject of rights. Okay. Those are the two fundamental steps. There could, some other issues can arise, and we could maybe talk about those in question. In, question and answer. But those are the two fundamental steps. Okay, so the first step, uh, uh, let me just add a little bit. I, I, I talked about some of the biological points that show this is a human organism, and this part of it is a biological point. The second part is the specifically ethical proposition. This is the biological point. Is this a human organism? And that's really a question. There, there are three Substeps in that step. <laughs> okay, three parts to that. First, this there this is science shows, or there are facts to show that this is a that the human embryo or human fetus from fertilization on is a distinct entity. It's not this is not a part of the organism, the human embryo or human fetus from fertilization on, from the zygote stage on, is not a part of the larger organism in which he or she resides. Okay. And how do we know that? We know that because he or she act, is, is growing in his or her own direction. Okay. Basically, the way that the way we know the, the way we know this is a distinct whole human organism is the same way we know that a six-week-old infant is a distinct whole human being, human organism. Okay, you've got a you know, six-week-old baby might be carrying him in your arms. Somebody, they're not likely to do this, but somebody might say, well, how do you know that's a human being? You know? Well, how do we know it's a human? I mean, this, a six-week-old baby looks very different from you and me. Uh, they make funny sounds. We put clothes on them, yeah, but they, you know, they soil their clothes quickly. So, I mean, they're very different. They're kind of strange beings when you think about it. Okay, they're very different from us. But how, so how do we know that they, they don't yet, they're not yet self-conscious. They don't yet have concepts of themselves. They don't yet make free choices. They don't yet reason. So how do we know that they're human beings? Well, we know they're human beings because they're growing in their own direction. 
they're active, they're the kinds, they're engaging in activities that are not subordinated to the mother and the father. We know that because we don't, a lot of times we don't like what they do. All right. But they're, act, they're acting and they're growing in their own direction. Well, the same thing with, uh, with a, an embryo or fetus from the very beginning. He or she is actively developing himself or herself in his or her own direct, develop, direction not subordinated to the well-being or the, or the, or the uh, uh, survival of the mother. Okay. So it's a distinct organism. Secondly, it's obviously human. The genetic structure shows that it's human. Uh, the, uh, it's, all, it's a product of humans. Of course it's human. That's, that's an easy one. How do we know it's a whole human organism? Well, the same way we know that a six-week-old infant is a whole human organism. This is an important point because uh, there is human tissue and human cells, which are, they're human, but they're not whole human organisms. So being human and even being distinct isn't the same thing as being a whole human or complete human organism. You can have an explanted heart. You take a heart out, you know, a, in a transplant, they take the heart out and they put it in an ice chest. Well, there's a heart there. It's not a whole human, human being. It, it is human, though. It has a genetic structure of a human. Uh, so there are cells, there are tissues, there are even organs that are, that are, uh, that are human, but not yet whole, not or not, that, that are human, but not whole human organisms. So how do we know this is a whole human organism? Well, the answer is because it has, unlike a cell, like a skin cell that you leave on the on a desk, or unlike a like a tissue, like tissue, and unlike a heart in a you know in, in an ice chest, it has the internal the embryo has the in all of the internal resources needed to actively develop herself to the mature stage of a human organism. She is immature, yes but she's still a whole human organism. She's not, the human embryo is not functionally a part of a larger organism. She is functioning, all of the different cells are functioning for the whole embryo and for the survival and the, and the development of that whole embryo. Okay, so that's an important, that's, that's sort of my clarification on that first point is to say, divide up the question there, there's three points that need to be shown. It is, and, and the biological facts show that it is distinct and that it is a uh, human, obviously, and also that it's a whole human organism, not functionally a part of a larger one. So it's a human organism, a distinct, whole, albeit immature, human organism, the embryo or fetus. The next question is, OK, well, is this a person? Because some people will say, yes, I know, science shows that it's a human organism. Philosophers, I mean, there, there are people you know, who will write, you know, write on the internet and deny that it's a human organism. But uh, you know, in philosophical circles or argumentative circles, they usually won't say that. Right. They'll grant, yes, it's a human organism. Science shows that. But then they might say it's not a human person. And by that, they mean it's not a subject of rights. Okay. They might say that this is not a per this is a human organism, but it's not a person because in order to be a person, you have to have self-consciousness. And the embryo or the fetus, they would say, does not yet have self-consciousness. Or they might say, in order to be a person, you have to have self-conscious desires and this being does not yet have self-conscious desires. The embryo or fetus does not have self-conscious desires. So they say, yes, it's wrong to kill a person, but it's not wrong to kill, a, there are some human organisms it's okay to kill because they're not persons, that's their argument. Well, the, one of the main, the, there are several problems with that position, and I think it's important to, to understand those, that understand the position and also understand where it goes wrong. First of all, if 
that position were right, it would follow that infants are not person, persons either. Because infants don't yet do anything that embryos or fetuses do except for breathe, breathe on their own. They don't yet have self-conscious desires. It takes them several months to develop that. They don't yet have a concept of themselves. They're not yet reasoning. They're not yet free to that. But so if in order to be a person, you have to have self-consciousness, it would follow that infanticide would be OK, subject to the approval of parents. Now, most people will then say that there must be something wrong. There are some philosophers who will say, OK, infanticide is OK, but most people will, will not bite the bullet on that. But that's an indication. There's some, most people realize that infanticide is wrong. But if, in order to be a person, in order to be a subject of rights, you need to have, uh, have self-consciousness, then it would follow that an infant would not be a person, would not be a subject of rights. And then it would be OK to kill infants with the approval of parents. Secondly, um, I worked, uh, or I didn't work, I followed around doctors in, uh, in the intensive care unit uh, for, for a few years and uh, saw a lot of people in comas in the neurological intensive care unit. And it's a fact, of course, that people can get into a car accident, have brain injury, and be in comas for days, sometimes even weeks, and then recover. So someone who's in a, a human being in a coma, is that human being who is in a coma a subject of rights? Is it OK? Would it be OK to kill that being because he can't right now make free choices. He's not right now self-conscious. That's what being in a coma is, right? Lack of self-consciousness, lack of consciousness completely. So this comatose individual might be in that coma for, for days, even weeks. But we realize that it's not OK to go kill that human being. Why? Because what makes him valuable I think the best explanation for this is that what makes him valuable, what makes him a subject of rights, is not what he, what he can do right now, because the comatose human individual cannot right now do the, any kind of thing that an embryo or fetus can't do. He's not self-conscious. He's not making free choices. He doesn't have a concept of self. He doesn't have self-conscious desires. All of the things they say that make an embryo or fetus a non-person are true of the comatose human individual. What does that indicate? That indicates that what makes someone a subject of rights is not the attributes that they acquire at some time, not a capacity to do something in the next several minutes or even the next day or two, but the fundamental kind of being that he or she is. Now, that comatose individual has what we would call, what you could call, a basic natural capacities to reason, make free choice, and so on. It will take him or her several days or weeks to get to the point where he can now actualize those capacities again. But he does have those capacities. It's kind of like there now. I don't know. I, there's, is there anybody here who can run a marathon? That we got one or two. We have a lot of a lot of kids back there. Uh, I don't think. Uh, okay, now there are some. Okay, we got one or two who could right now run a marathon. But I think we probably have several others who could. But in order to run the marathon, they would need to train for it. Now, I don't think I could ever run a marathon. Uh, I think at one point I was at a stage where I could have, but now I've had a knee replacement, so I'm, I'm off the list. But, but if, the, the, if you, some of these kids over there, I see them out there in the, in the, the next to last row there, they may not now be able to run, they may not be able to run the marathon the next day or two, but they have the basic capacity to do so. They have a capacity to develop themselves to the point where they do that. 
when the embryo or fetus comes to be, he or she does not have a capacity to reason and make free choices right then. They can't right now. But he or she has the basic natural capacity to develop himself or herself to the stage where they will do all of that. That's the fundamental kind of being that a human embryo or human fetus is, the same kind of being as you or I. So that's the second, the, thir the third problem. The first problem with the, with the human but not a person position is, to say, is that, well, it would disqualify infants. The second problem is that it would disqualify comatose beings. The third problem is that what it does is it picks out what, we, what you could call proximate capacities, a capacity to do something in the next few minutes or the next day or so, and, and look at those and ignore the basic natural capacities that a being has, that a thing has, just because of the kind of being that he or she is. Even though it may take that being several weeks, months, maybe even several years to develop that capac those capacities. They're still there. That's the kind of thing that is. And that's why we place value on comatose individuals, because they're the same kind of being. Even though they can't right now exercise these capacities, they're the same kind of being as you and I. They have those basic natural capacities. So that brings us back. The last point I think we sh you should make is one I, 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 I adverted to earlier, but I w would reiterate it. Now, and that is that what's at stake in this debate is the question of what makes you and me valuable as subjects of rights. Because what you have, or you have some people in effect saying that in order to be valuable as a subject of rights, you need to have certain inessential attributes. And we're saying that no, in order to be valuable as a subject of rights, it's the kind of being that one is that counts. It's you don't have to be, it's, as long as you're, you, it's, it's you that makes you valuable. It's me that makes me valuable. It's the person you are, the thing that you are, not the attributes that you acquire at certain stages of your life. So you are valuable as a subject of rights then, or every person, every human being is valuable as a subject of rights from the moment they come to be and until they cease to be. They don't lose their rights before they cease to be either. That's what was at stake in the debate over slavery. And what we said there was that every human being has equal fundamental dignity, no matter what the color of his or her skin. Now the question is, does every human being have fundamental dignity despite his or her size? It's the same sort of question. And that's one I think I would, would, would focus on. Right? So I uh, hope there are some questions or comments, and we have some time for that.